everybody, Dennis Prager and Julie Hartman. Dennis and Julie. Who are matching today? See, this is a classic example of the male brain and female brain. Had you said to me, what do you and Julie have in common today? And we will not give you food until you guess, I would have starved to death. (laughs) And the first thing that Julie said was, is it okay that we have matching shirts? Okay, if that's a male-female difference. I have even a lot to say about male-female differences. We've, oh, believe brain, me, we've I, talked I, about I it. I know, but the brain, I got, I, I'm not getting into it. I'm not getting into it. The weeks go fast. By the way, in from the very beginning of our uh, podcasts, did we ever miss a week? Nope. I love that. And that's amazing, given my travels, given that you were still at school. Mm -hmm. So since I was with you, I spent four days in northern Alaska. (laughs) That is amazing to me. It is amazing. And by the way, you called me one time, and then I missed the call, and I was going to return it. And I thought, oh, gosh, the time difference must be massive. One hour. It's one hour. Yeah. I looked it up, and then I, I... realized it was stupid to have not called you back you're just an hour behind us which a rare time zone there there's eastern central mountain pacific and alaska <laughs> have you been to alaska before many times really yes i've never been i i love 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 alaska but at the moment it became possible for me to give a speech in fairbanks which is way north it's it's uh six hours drive north it's it's like L.A. to San Francisco, which is a long trip. Yeah. Anchorage, which is already north. Right. Anchorage, not northern Alaska, but Anchorage to Fairbanks is due north. Let's Here's a way of explaining how north it is. So I, I took uh, Sue and her kids, my, my two stepsons. So we went uh, L.A., Seattle, Fairbanks. Seattle is the very top of the United States in Mm -hmm. the Northwest. So that's quite north. You fly three and a half hours nonstop north to get to Fairbanks. That is the equivalent of going from L.A. to Chicago. Or L.A. to Oklahoma. Why'd you pick on Oklahoma? No, I wasn't picking on it. I just went there No, no, I know not picking. I mean, Well, because the flight is three hours. Right. So with great love and respect, more people will relate to L.A. Chicago no, Dennis, than L.A. I'm Oklahoma. correcting you here. L.A. Chicago is four hours. It's not three and a half. Oh my God! Precision's important. I'm letting Mr. Julie Clear do, doing. Julie will be doing the Dennis and Julie <laughs> podcast today. It will be called mm and Julie. <laughs> What's his name? And Julie. I'm so, telling you, Oklahoma is the so, better comparison. All right, but think about it. How long it is to go to the Midwest from L.A., and that's how much north of Seattle Fairbanks is. It's amazing. So why did I take the speech there? I uh, I wanted to first, and why in the winter? I could have gone in the summer. A, I wanted to experience 25 below. I've never experienced that. <laughs> I'm serious. Only you. That's true. I that admit is the it. most to you. Yes. I wanted to experience yes, 25 Yes, I really, below. really wanted to. And B, I wanted to see the Northern Lights, the Aurora Borealis, one of the great natural... Phenomena. Uh, thank you. That God has given to the human race. So, I'm, I'm truly laughing. We, we end up going for four days... Not one night was the Aurora Borealis visible. No, you didn't see it? And wait, and here's the corker. No. That was the only week this winter when the temperature went above zero. It went Mm. to four. (laughs) By the way, you'll love this. Every morning I would look on my uh, my phone, temperature in Fairbanks. So one morning it says four degrees feels like three <laughs> now is that hilarious yes it or... is <laughs> you can really what, notice what that the one hell degree. Is the difference between four and three oh so, so you didn't see them at all no and i didn't get to have 25 below but i still had the greatest time because 
Uh, by the way, to see the Northern Lights, it's not. There are two major factors uh, that either enable you or, or not enable you to see them. Uh, one is obvious. The obvious is there a cloud covering. If, if it's a cloudy sky at night, you can't see it. Uh, that's obvious. The other, which I had no idea about, is sun activity. Oh wow! Who would I, who would know that? So. Even if it's a completely clear sky and it, the sun activity is not taking place that creates the aurora borealis, you won't see it. So uh, we were we were cursed with the sun's activities while we were there. Were sun went on vacation, but you're ready for the next. And I have a philosophical thought on this. We left on a Sunday. I had a speech in Seattle, so we went from Fairbanks, Seattle, and I went. To, to give a speech at a big church there. And the there is an app. There is an actual Aurora Borealis app. Of course. For when you can see and when yeah. you, won't, you won't be able to see that week. We left Sunday morning to get to Seattle Sunday night was the best visibility that month. Hmm. And I'm in Seattle giving a speech. So what does one do? And I, this is meant seriously. So I was disappointed on, on the cold. It was only zero, <laughs> which is a riot. And I, I didn't get to see the Northern Lights. And literally only God knows if I'll ever get to see them. You don't get there much in the winter to such northern climes, northern latitudes. So this is the attitude the human being must a adopt to survive life. Mm -hmm. That y you win some and you lose some. That's it. End of issue. I'll give you a good example of uh, how I adopted this. The lockdowns. I lost nearly 50% oh, right. of my college experience. That's bigger than the Aurora Borealis. <laughs> due to lockdowns. And it was, you know, it was, so, it was so sad for so many reasons. A, because I sacrificed my entire high school years on the altar of getting into college. And then once I got into college, I thought, I mean, I, and I worked my tail off in college too. You know me, I, I can't ever not <laughs> work really right. hard. But, you know, I, I had a lot of fun. And I remember sophomore year, halfway through sophomore year when I was sent home. And I, the rest of sophomore year, I was home. And the entirety of junior year, I was home, which means I got no junior year of college, zero. And I felt like I had just kind of gotten my footing and really, you know, solidified my friendships and my place on campus and all that. And we were sent home. And it was, for a year and a half, just, it was depressing, you know, couldn't see anybody we, locked up. I was in my parents' house for like eight months. It was, you know, and I was this young, Versus vibrant. a very robust college life. I mean, you went to Harvard. I'll yeah. say it, you didn't. Harvard stinks for many reasons, but it does have a robust Absolutely. intellectual and artistic life. Oh my gosh. And immense opportunities, just yeah. immense. Uh, you know, I mean, I went to Israel my senior year on a on a travel trip. They they had all these opportunities. You could go into Boston free, go to the museums, go to the the JFK library. I mean, just just immense opportunities there. And I was really resentful because on top of it being very sad, it was unnecessary. And that was the thing that made me crazy because it's like, why is this happening to us right now? And B, it doesn't need to happen. Mm -hmm. We are between 18 and 24 years old. We're not at risk of dying of COVID, literally under a thousand people. Eight, it's, I'm not getting the stat exactly right, but I was reading the other day, under a thousand people aged like 18 to 26 died of COVID. And, but, but here's the thing. I remember thinking the resentment and the sadness and the sense of loss is going to eat you up in life, Julie. If you don't Very good. Seriously, I remember thinking Very, this. That's impressive. And I and I that's still right. to this day have this mantra and I go, guess what? 
That's I'm right. a healthy young woman. My parents well, are you, alive. You have a, I live right. in America. And by the way, COVID was great for me because look at what happened. I discovered you, you know? So I, I mean, but a lot of my friends yeah. in COVID did not have, <laughs> didn't meet Dennis Prager and then get a talk show. <laughs> That's right. No, but I thought, you know what, Julie? Life, forgive me for, for saying it so bluntly. Life is going to screw you over sometimes. That's right. And it screws everyone over. It's just a matter of time and a matter of how. And I've had a pretty damn By good life. By the way, life. I do want to say something. Uh, this was your attitude prior to our meeting. Of course, so yes. That, no, no, I just want people to understand. I know I've touched your life. I'm thrilled I, beyond words. It's one of the great achievements in, of my life. That's how much I value you. But this was completely Dennis free. Mm -hmm. This was Julie independently. That's a big deal. You, you live... Two enormous rules of my own life. My chapter in my happiness book on not having expectations. So you are more likely to be pleasantly surprised than horribly disappointed. Mm -hmm. That's huge. There's no other way to live life. That's what I felt, you know, and your loss was bigger than my not seeing the Aurora Borealis. Uh, but nevertheless, that was... One of the one of the two things I look forward to, and I got neither of them. You know that one night we traveled three hours in complete darkness on icy roads. It's not fun, and I drive yeah all over the world. Right? No, that's scary. Uh, three hours, and I can say very few people can say this. I drove three hours to see nothing. <laughs> And then drove three hours back. No, no, no. An hour and a half each way. Oh, oh, I see. Yeah. I see. It was not by dog sled. By the way, while I was giving a speech, the family went and did a dog sled. I've done a dog sled before. That's a blast. Yes, you, you should. Well, it's, 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 it's a fun thrill. What is amazing about those dogs is that they love it. I mean, they're in 25 below weather, wow. running their tail off, right. and they're happy as, as, as a clam, which is a very odd word for a, a husky but, you know, <laughs> in the snow. But it, anyway, th this, th this is a big deal for people to understand. Everything in life is how you react to it. Yes. I, I have thought that recently. I, I thought, what if I got in front of an audience of, of you know, 5,000 people and I said to them, I've got something for all of you. I don't care where you're from, what background you have, how much you've been through in life. You can be rich, you can be poor, you can be black, you can be white, you can be American, you can be, you know, victims of authoritarian regimes all around the world. I have a solution that applies to all of you and will make all of you happy if you choose it. And that is adopting a good worldview. That's what it is. Your worldview is everything. Everything. And so I, I thought of that when I was, you know, sent home due to the lockdowns. I remember thinking, okay, Julie, you're gonna, you are going to slide down a hill of resentment and anger and sadness if you don't buck up and realize that life is unfair and you've had a pretty good life and this, these are the cards you've been dealt. And in the, in, the, in the tally of things, you're coming out on top. I'll give you another example of how early on in my life, a, a worldview that I adopted really changed me for the better and made my, me a lot less miserable. So as you know, I went to a very, very competitive all girls private high school in Los Angeles. And basically the entire vocation of all of us was to get into college. That was it. I mean, all of us all day were just w with the loading up on AP and honors classes, doing these grueling sports, running for student government. We were all trying to get into college. And so I remember... Yeah, well, to, just to be more precise, into a prestigious college. A presti yes, exactly. A prestigious college. But that was what all of us cared about, bar none. And I remember because your, your transcript when you apply to colleges only starts in ninth grade. And my school was 7th through 12th. And so I remember in 8th grade, I was thinking, oh gosh, you know, ninth grade is ahead of us. This is when it's all going to start. And the, the rat race begins, really begins. And I, I remember I was on the bus home and I was looking out the window and I was thinking, I'm going to be miserable for four years because 
A, I'm going to slog away, but B, I'm going to look around at all these people. And I went to, to high school with, with hugely smart, competent, talented girls and c- girls who had parents who were legacies at these prestigious universities. You know, we all kind of had each other's number a bit. And I remember thinking, I'm going to be miserable for the next four years if I don't figure out a way to deal with this because there's going to be a girl, there are going to be girls who are going to do way better in me than school are going to do better in me than sports. And I've got to figure out how to deal with that. Dennis Prager here with a man I have come to admire for his work. So when I asked him, what do you do? This is the title he gave, wealth architect. Very simply put, I am a wealth architect that helps my clients accelerate the way they grow your wealth. It's not how much you make, it's how much you keep. The Internal Revenue Code is embedded with a number of things that you can take advantage of. It's what I call playing tax chess. We take the time to play tax chess in your favor. We give our clients unbiased, independent advice across all areas in their financial life because we have no incentive to sell anything. I was taken enough and impressed enough to have you do my work. And you have, in fact, saved me a serious amount of money. CharlesDombeck.com slash Prager. So here's what I came up with. And it shows you, by the way, the seeds of my worldview now or my conservatism were always there. I just didn't know. I didn't have any language to ascribe to it. And I came up with this thought, which is, if someone does better than I do, and they worked hard, and they got it on their own merits, I should be happy for them. I shouldn't be resentful, I shouldn't be jealous for two reasons. First, they're setting a good example for me and they're they're making me better because I wanna catch up to them. And second, crucially, if a system is rewarding people based on their own merit, that's a benefit for all of us. Because if a meritocratic system is going to reward that girl for you know doing well on the SAT, then the meritocratic system will reward me for doing well on the SAT. So more, more merit being rewarded is like a cosmic justice for all of us. That's impressive. Well, it's, it really was just trying to save myself from, from being your, resentful and jealous. What you described is George Gilder, the, one of the great minds of of the last 50 years. George Gilder's book, The Israel Test. Mm. His whole thesis, and one could watch it at PragerU. I interviewed him on my show. Isn't he terrific? Oh, he's wonderful, yes. He wrote a book on capitalism recently. He's not a youngster. No, he's not. He's still phenomenal. Yeah. George Gilder uh, wrote a book, The Israel Test. He does a five-minute video on The Israel Test for PragerU for those who want to watch him summarize his thesis. The thesis is essentially watch how people react to those who do better and you will know that basically you know that person. You, you, you can predict how they will act in life. And he said, Israel is the test. Israel has done better than all of its surrounding countries and all of the surrounding countries hate Israel for it. If Israel were as a big a failure as the Palestinian entity is, right. as the Syrian entity, as the Iraqi entity, then it wouldn't be nearly as hated. That they, that they made l- literally uh, a mosquito-infested area into Tel Aviv mm-hmm. uh, is what drives their haters crazy. But by the way, it's one of the sources of anti-Semitism. Jews have generally done better, and I don't mean just financially. More stable uh, family life, uh, less crime, less alcoholism, and and everybody knows how critical I am with many Jews' ideas, (laughs) Uh, so this is not chauvinism, it's just a fact. George Gilder is a Christian, he's not a Jew. So what you said, you passed the Israel test, having nothing to do with Israel specifically. If those girls got ahead without cheating, yep. et cetera, and they all more did. power to them. So you have a choice, though. And this is the Israel test. You, Julie, could have said they cheated. They got they got into a Harvard, and I didn't. You did, but I'm just saying if <laughs> right. you didn't. They got into Harvard uh, because of legacy, because of 
Y or Z, or they cheated on tests and they got away with it. They manipulated the system and they, they got in. And you resent them. Or you could say, wait a minute, if they did make it honestly, that that's great. So I have to figure out how can I do it honestly? And as you said, that that was a great innovation of your thought. It's better for me in the in the long run. Because then it, it, it yes, lays then the I have a for chance. me to succeed. Yes, that's right. So I'll I'll tell you this really I, I thought of my eighth grade self looking out of the bus window <laughs> having this revelation when I was in college because I uh, there was a guy in my dorm who uh, is Nigerian and I just love talking with people from different parts of the world, different walks of life and like interrogating them <laughs> about their upbringing and, and all of that. And he said to me something that totally startled me. Now I know that I know better than anyone that our system here in the United States is unique for many reasons, but I think I, I didn't quite understand just how bad it is elsewhere in many places. This Nigerian friend of mine told me he had to take the SAT five times even though he got a perfect score on the first time. Why do you think that is? I say in Nigeria? In yeah, or he I think Or here. He, uh, in Nigeria. So so basically the SAT and the ACT, I don't know if he took it in Nigeria, but he you have to fly to like my I have a really close friend from Kazakhstan. She had to fly to Turkmenistan to take the ACT because they didn't offer it in Kazakhstan. So I don't know if he took it in Nigeria or another country on the continent. But it was it was but, for Nigeria. Yes. And why did he have to? So the Nigerian government insisted, or the Nigerian state, or the yes. Nigerian education, or perhaps system. for maybe it wasn't the SAT, but it was it was okay. I think some it national was. test, some, some national test. Why did yes. he have to take it five times? Because he came from a wealthy family. No, no, no. He I'm, got I'm, no, no, no. I'm guessing. No. Why he got a perfect score the first time? Why would you need to take it five yeah. times? Someone bribed the officials to steal his score. Oh yeah, okay. I should have thought of that. And and it happened. Yes. It happened five Th- that's times. That's right. This is they, the norm. Scores... In the, this is the norm in human it society. Is. It is. That's why when people crap on America, it, it shows the it ignorance that me. they have yes. of elsewhere. And they're ingrates. When I was in, I've been all over Africa. I've been to twenty African countries. Well, I don't wow. remember. It's yeah, amazing. It is amazing. I've traveled a lot, um, and I love that. And I that's why I wanted to go to Fairbanks. I I love it. I want to see the world before I leave this world. And I've seen a lot of it. Anyway, uh, we were on, in West Africa. I don't remember which country. It, it was either, let's see, Ghana or Gambia or Togo uh, or uh, I don't know which remember the fourth. And anyway, so we had a driver, a, a local African driver. And he looks at us and he says, watch this. We're driving on a street and there's a police Blockade. If you gave the policeman a certain amount of money, they opened up the barrier. There was pure bribery. Yep. 100%. Yep. Your car doesn't move till you pay the cops some money. Yep. So, so that's, again, why when people succeed on their own merits, we should be so happy because it's another... It's another Penny in the right, jar so you're cursed with this with system. The, with a very powerful sense of reason. We you is, said I'm cursed? Yeah. I love that. We, that. That is a whole subject onto its own. I love that you put it that way. It, it, in many ways, it is a curse. I know it because I, I am similarly cursed. We wouldn't have it any other way. Because right. the thought of being run by my emotions is so frightening to me that I, I don't want to go there. But... Acting rationally and thinking rationally is is as rare as almost as rare as courage. Courage is more rare, I admit it, but thinking rationally. You know, the, the age of reason ushered in in the eighteenth, nineteenth mm-hmm, century mm-hmm. has produced at least as much irrationality. Remember, the West is the inheritor of the age of reason. And only in the West do they say people give uh, men give birth. Right, right. We, the, there is the, the amount of irrationality in the Western world is is ex- extraordinary. Maybe we need reason and God. Oh, okay. So recently on Timeless, it is 
very well said and a hugely important insight. Recently on Timeless, I welcomed to the show a man named Rob Henderson, who went to... Did he do the luxury? Yes, which it was by the way... brilliant article. By the way, I am not... I, I am not saying that he took it from me. I think this is something that people, you know, recognize. I said this on Dennis and Julie like a year ago. I said beliefs can be just as luxurious as the finest jewelry, cars, vacations. You know, if you believe if you if you get so offended by a conservative speaker, you're pretty damn privileged. You haven't had to face a lot in life. So I'm again, truly I'm not implying in any way he took it from me, but I just just want to say for the record that I yours truly you. had, had the no, observation. It is to your credit. So I welcomed to the show Rob Henderson, who wrote you know that article, as you say, about luxury beliefs. And he, he went to Yale and he went to Cambridge and got a PhD. And he was in, he's a veteran. He, he served in the army and he grew up in foster care. Um, and to a drug addicted mother, a father he never met. And he just published a great book, which people should get called Troubled. And it's about his upbringing and how he became conservative and how he saw that a lot of the things that the left advocates for uh, or gives passes to, like fatherlessness, you know, when Black Lives Matter say things like, oh, we want to upend the Western prescribed notion of the nuclear family, he outlines, you know, people think that's, a cool belief to have, but it actually comes at great cost to those who are less fortunate. Anyway. We because were, they'll adopt it. Yes. It's critical. Right. The, the, the elite doesn't. It, well, exactly. The elite practice bourgeoisie values and then scorn bar bourgeoisie values. I highlighted this in a, my senior speech at Harvard. I said those who decry, uh, you know, the new or those who disparage the nuclear family grew up in two parent households. I remember there was someone in college. I was having a debate with them about, you know, the <laughs> it's amazing. It was even a debate about the necessity of the nuclear family. And I'll never forget. She looked at me and she goes. The nuclear family, what are we in, like the 1950s? And I paused and I said, wait a minute, didn't you grow up in a two-parent household? Really? Don't this you, actually happened? This actually happened. I said, don't you have a mother and father what who year, are happily what married? What year were you in? 2020. I was having all these debates with my friends because I was becoming conservative. Anyway, anyway, so back to your point, because you said we need, you're talking about reason, and you were saying we need reason, but we need God. That is the critical supplement. Mm-hmm. And Rob Henderson, when we were talking, we were t discussing, you know, where this wokeism comes from. And he had this great line where he said, you know, I think this is kind of a tax that we have to pay in a free society and in the Western world. Now, I would dispute that we have to pay the tax, but I take his point that we, we live in a society which grants us the right to say whatever we want. And we should recognize that privilege and also recognize the responsibility that comes with that privilege to not abuse it and to not let it go too far. We we should exercise our freedom of speech to advocate for responsible values instead of using it to advocate all of this sludge. And the critical thing here is is that we don't like we we don't have that supplement of God and of wisdom. John Adams said this great line where he said, you know, this this system that we've created in the United States was created for a moral and religious people. Because otherwise, we will we will just let our freedoms run rampant and we will abuse those freedoms if we do not supplement them with 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 a Judeo-Christian wise world. Not rooted in that. Right. Yep. So, anyway, watch watch that episode with Rob Henderson. So let me go back to Fairbanks. Oh, I'm, I didn't realize you were done. I'm sorry. No, I, oh. I veered as much as you Okay. Did. So what was the joy if I didn't get to, to see the Aurora Borealis and I didn't get to experience 25 below? And that is two things. And they, they will stick with me. One is, if you if you have not visited a world of snow, then you can only imagine what it is like. These people live in a city that is essentially white for at least four months a year, maybe six. Wow. Yes, wow. 
it, it creates a, a different sense of life. And I actually deeply appreciated it for some reason. First of all, I think, I think, have you ever been in, because you grew up in California, mm -hmm. have you ever been in a snowfall? Oh, of course, yes. Where? Oh, I've been skiing. And, oh, that's right. You ski. Okay. And I, and I went to college in Boston. Okay, fair. Good. A small school outside of Boston. So tell me, and I, you, it's obvious what answer I want, but don't give me the answer I want if you don't believe it. Do you know of anything in nature that creates the sense of peace that a snowfall does? Rain. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Okay, fair enough. So they're equal? No. Snow's more. Okay. All right. So there you go. All right. Uh, by the way, I agree on rain. Although if you lived in Seattle, I'm not sure you yeah, would Yeah, we in Los Angeles, yes, I love the rain. Yes, that's right. But snow, when I grew up in New York and, and it snowed, I remember as a kid, this sense of peace yeah. that would overtake me. Just It's mm. quiet. See, rain is loud. Snow is quiet. So that, that's also a factor. And of course, the rain, I mean, it stays in puddles. So are you ready to lose weight, but not sure where to start? So I'd like to tell you why I chose PhD Weight Loss and Nutrition and why I recommend it to you. I've never advertised a weight loss program. First, Dr. Ashley Lucas has her PhD in Chronic Disease and Sports Nutrition. The program is science-based. The PhD program starts with nutrition, but it's much more. They know that 90% of permanent change comes from the mind, and they work on eliminating the reason you gained weight in the first place. There are no shortcuts, no pills, no injections, just solid science-based nutrition and behavior change. It's been very effective with me. My colleagues Seb Gorka and Mike Gallagher have extolled its virtues. So if you're ready to lose weight for the last time, call 864-644-1900 to get started. Or go online at myphdweightloss.com and just make the appointment for your one-on-one -on -one consultation. Call today, 864-644-1900. Snow builds up and it... it so in, in Fairbanks, this is, again, hours north, six-hour drive north of Anchorage. You, you're really, by the way, it's so, it's so north, there's nothing essentially north of Fairbanks. It, there is no road. You can get, you can fly to the top of, of Alaska, mm -hmm. Nome, or you can go by a dog sled. You cannot drive. The roads basically end going north at, in the area of Fairbanks. That, so I'm just, again, showing. It's sort of like an English-language Siberia, that, that area of Alaska. And I, I have to tell you, because we live in the greatest weather on Earth. Southern California is the greatest weather on Earth. They say Cape Town and Perth are tied, but fine. It's the greatest weather in the world. And I deeply appreciate that. Uh, the weather. It's one of the only remaining good things about California. But I, I, it was the first time I thought I could live here. I could live in this unbelievably freezing cold. It creates, I don't, I, I can't fully verbalize it. It creates, as I said, a certain peace. And it, it's, you you're so connected to nature because nature is so impinging on your life. Mm -hmm. I went, needless oh, to say, so cool. you'll, you'll love this. So I went, I went on Friday afternoon. Uh, they invited me to a cigar lounge because everybody knows I smoke cigars. And, you know, some local cigar smokers heard about it and they came as well. So I asked the proprietor, how's business? And he said, well, totally straight-faced. You'll love this. He goes, it's fine. But I'll admit, when it gets 60 below, people don't like leaving their house. <laughs> <laughs> is this yeah. guy for real? 
uh-huh. when they're soon at 60. So I said, uh-huh. you mean 25 below is a non-issue? Oh, no. Uh-huh. We're, we're full then. <laughs> yeah, it's like 70 but, but, and sunny. But 60 below, they, they, they prefer to stay home. <laughs> I so take your point, Dennis, and I think we should follow up on this, that they, I love what you just said. They're connected more with nature. Yeah. Because they have to be. That's right. Um, I don't. I, I would love to live in the snow. I don't know if I'd want to live in 25 below. There are other places right. to find snow where you where you can have that. But so, you know that I am fascinated by the question of why so few people in my generation believe in God. Not just in my generation, but really in the modern, you know, right. the last 100, 150 years. And obviously it's because we've been brainwashed. We've been taught that, you know, religion is defective and antiquated. And as you so eloquently argue, we haven't been taught the necessity of God. And you always, I love when you say this because it's exactly what happened to me. You said, I don't argue for the existence of God. I argue for the necessity of God. And then and then when people realize the necessity of God, they'll be led to believe in the existence. Literally, that is precisely what occurred when I read your Torah commentary. It's brilliant. But I think another reason, maybe like 20, 15, 20% of the explanation is that we have man-made bias. In other words... Literally look at where we are right now. Everything around us is man-made. When you're, dri- when you're driving down the street, you're in your car, which is man-made. You're looking at skyscrapers, which is man-made. You're looking at the telephone wires. The temperature you're looking in your at the, car is man-made. The temperature in your car is everything. Listening to the radio is man-made. Nearly every single thing that we do that, that, are, that are, I mean, like hallmarks of our lives are man-made. And I can't, I think that has contributed to us getting away from God. Because think about it. If you live in Fairbanks, Alaska, or let's see. Even... That is a very powerful insight. Thank you. That's why I'd like to do a podcast with you. <laughs> so cool. I mean, I just want to say as an aside, sometimes I think about my old self when I was first discovering you and your books. And then when I wrote you an email. I would have been thrilled if you wrote back, thanks. Like, I, that would have made my year. And then the fact that I'm sitting across, anyway, so I don't mean to say it tough. as a bragging thing. It's really, just, really I don't tough. take it for granted. Um, but I think this has contributed to, to this more than we might think, because if you're in Fairbanks, Alaska, or let's go back 300, 500 years. So it's a question. Do you think more people percentage-wise believe in God in Fairbanks? Yes. Than elsewhere? I do. Well, I think that's for another reason, which is I think they are physically and ideologically more removed from the absurd mainland of the United States and what's been allowed to take hold there. That's true. But I I really do think, because when you were, let's go back like 500 years ago, okay? Yeah. You look around you and 95% or 90% of what you're seeing is not man-made. It's something that you you have awe and and wonder at you're looking at the moon you're looking at the sun food exact great great observation because now we have all this the this processed food mountains you know plants trees you look around and you and back then you realize i didn't create this something or someone else did now we live in this world where everything is created by man so we think that's just all it's been and we discount. So okay, so here here's a challenge. Okay. I, I everything you said is valid, but when you said that they're removed from the mainland, I thought of the only other state removed from the mainland, Hawaii. Yeah. Which is which is quite left and Fair. probably f- fairly uh, atheist. Maybe, but oh. but maybe there's another factor. Okay, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. I no, I got don't excited. be sorry. Go ahead. Okay, but don't forget your point. It might be your point, but oh. I'll let you make it. I think life is probably harder that's in right. Alaska. That's right. That's correct. That's my point. Okay. Well, I'll tell you quickly, and then I want to hear the great way that you're go- going to explain it. But I, I love Niccolo Machiavelli, the 16th century Italian I writer. I love him. And people are going to go, oh, of course she does. You know, the bigot conservative loves the 
you should right, be cynic. feared and not. Right. But I'm telling you, I did a whole episode on it. Machiavelli gets a bad rap. He actually is a lot more attuned to morality and virtues than you might expect. Anyway, he has all of these like because his book, The Prince, is about like how to build a civilization. And one of the things that he advises a ruler, and again, he's in the 16th century, so take it with a grain of salt to do, is he said, settle on harsh land. Oh, how interesting. Right? And he says, you don't want it to be so harsh as to be totally debilitating right. where you have no crops, but settle on land that is takes not work. easy, that takes work. Because then your population is busy, your population is united, your population has a shared goal. I now know why you're a Machiavelli fan. Oh, that, that is... Trust if me. that's typical of his insight, that's, that's brilliant. That is like... I, that's like here on the totem pole of the Machiavelli insights. Oh, you, you think that one's good? Pfft. Watch my timeless episode on it, but I will. But I think they don't like in Alaska, and in the pl harsh places where Machiavelli-inspired rulers settled, they didn't have the luxury in the free time to think about crazy ideas. They had to work on their survival, on building their civilization, etc. Plowing their roads. Yes. You know what do you yes. think? I, I told, that was the point I was going to make. It's the God issue is it has a, a, a an, I think an analogy or an analogous situation. Mm -hmm. You'll you'll love this. Here's a question I have because you do the same thing, which is why I one of the many reasons I so enjoy you is mull over these questions. Who is more likely to believe in God? All th all other things being equal, one who suffers a great deal or one who has an affluent, healthy, easy, relatively easy life? It's, it's, so the answer we all know is the, the ones who suffer. Right. So why though? That's, the, that's my, always my follow-up question. Why? You would think that the one who has it easy will be grateful to God. Wow, did I luck out? I want, I, you know, I want to thank God. But that never happens, or not, I can't say never happens. Of course it happens, but most of the time it doesn't happen. Whereas the, the, the person who suffers, it's not that they, people will dismiss, oh, well, they think God will help them. Okay, most people know that. And by the way, even if they do think that, wh why is that something to scorn? You know what, that's, fa that's fair. But but it, what it does is it, it, it means that the reason that they believe in God is because they, they have this view of he'll, he'll help me out. So that doesn't argue for God in any way. That's what, they'll, that's what they'll, they'll maintain. So the one in the harsh environment, it, it, it's like my question, the one who has a harsh life. And they're more likely, people who have it good back to the necessity issue think they don't need a god is yes. there there's you'll love this line i wonder if you ever heard it and if you didn't you'll be very happy we're doing this podcast uh as if i wasn't happy already well, thank you. that we're doing yeah, it that, yes well it's mutual uh so and so is a self-made man and he and uh and he and he believes what is it and he believes in in, in his god what how does it go how does it go he's a self-made man and he believes in his God. Something, in other words, I made me. Mm. I am my God. Mm -hmm. the, so it's very common to think if you have it good, you know, that I'm totally self reliant. I need nothing. Right. But I wasn't even thinking of God when I was thinking of the power of of life in Fairbanks. In this in this regard of, uh, of being surrounded by cold surrounded by snow I, I I was very moved that's all I could say I did not expect it at all I I wanted the Aurora borealis and I and I wanted the cold weather the in, intensely cold it was obviously mm -hmm. cold and he believes in his creator that's it yes he is a self-made man and he worships his creator 
not God. That's that's the line. It's a great line. Mm. He's a self-made man, and he worships his creator. He's his creator. Mm-hmm. That, that that's that's the assumption. So uh, I uh, one other thing I learned. This you'll find fascinating. Who lives in Fairbanks? What type of person? It, it, that's not a normal place to live. And. The, the people of Fairbanks told me this. I, I didn't personally observe this. By and large, they're not a very sociable group. They're fine. They're mm. considerate. They're, mm. They have good values in many cases. But they're very happy to be alone in their house. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, well, they've had, I mean, they've had to be. Well, apparently so. I am fascinated it's so funny I think that's the word I use the most and I'm trying to work on it fascinated or interested but it really is true there's there's so much that I'm fascinated by but I'm sorry I know sometimes it's overkill but I am intrigued by the way that your your environment Mm -hmm. and I don't mean your your the way you were parented though certainly I'm interested in that as well I literally mean your climate your yes yes and I, there's a great book which people should read. I'm trying to get this guy on my show. His name is Tim Marshall, and he wrote The Power of Geography. And he profiles 10 countries, or maybe 15, but I think 10. And he explains how their geography has shaped their politics, their culture. Oh, I, I would so love that. It's so interesting. Have you read it? Of course. So give me an example. Okay, well, well I can give you two. So he... He talks, in the first chapter, he talks about Australia. And obviously, Australia is a isolated, isolated place. Um, and he, he sort of talks about how d- Australians are a bit more chill than most other people. And it's because they're very much like, like they're literally on an island. And it's because they're very much removed from the fray. And also they kind of feel that there's a buffer it, between them and a lot of other countries. So they're not as in danger, if you will, of having a, an invasion. That's just, that's a kind of small example as far as the other things he talks about. I, I truthfully don't remember all of that in the chapter, but if I went back to my notes, I could pull it up. But he also, um, oh, I'll give you one. He talked about um, in Iran, I didn't realize this, but Iran is very mountainous on the on the um, borders actually there are many good reasons to buy gold and silver bank failures digital currency volatility emerging market countries trying to topple the dollar as a global reserve currency julie hartman here for amfed coin and bullion dennis's choice for buying precious metals if you ask Amfed owner Nick Grovich to simplify the case for precious metals, he'll tell you that when President Roosevelt recalled the gold in circulation and paid people with paper money, they received a $20 bill for a $20 gold piece. Today, that $20 bill won't even fill half of your gas tank, but the gold piece is worth about $2,000. Which would you rather own? Now let's simplify the reasons to use Amfed coin in bullion. Nick has been in the industry for over 42 years and he's proud of providing transparency and fair pricing to build trusted relationships. If you're interested in buying or selling, call Nick and his team at Amfed coin in bullion, 1-800-221-7694, AmericanFederal.com, AmericanFederal.com. And so he said that's facilitated two things. Number one, it's made it more difficult for Iran to be invaded. And a lot of the times its enemies have encountered a lot of difficulty having to traverse the mountains. And he said, second, it allows these different um, ethnic and even religious minorities to have kind of their own enclaves. For instance, the Kurds in Iran live kind of in their own out. Thanks to mountains. Thanks to mountains, yes. Live in their own kind of protected enclave. Read the book. It's it's pretty cool. But even, I mean, look at the United States. We have benefited hugely from our geography. That's right. Having the buffer yes, of the two oceans. Of I mean, that's part of, of, and I believe more than anyone. Look at Britain. Britain is completely shaped by the fact that it's not part of Europe. Yes. Physically. Absolutely. And I, I am very much a 
conservative individualist, you charter your own destiny. It's not what you ate for lunch. It's not who your parents were. It's not this. You are the, you know, you're in charge of, of your fate. But but it is true that geography can, can really help or hurt. I'll, I'll give you another example that Astrid, your dear, our, our dear Danish friend, uh, told me. She said, because there's this huge influx of Muslim migrants going to Europe and even all the way up to Denmark. And the stats on that are incredible. Like just the A, the amount of migrants and B, uh, the the views that many of these individuals have wanting to bring Sharia law. Of course, not all of them, but you get my point. But you know what Astrid said to me? So brilliant. She said, you Americans are so lucky with your geography because as bad as your immigration problem is, the, the majority of immigrants are coming from Latin America, Central That's America, right. Christian countries where they're closer to your values. That's right. The immigrants by geography that we're getting are from the Middle East that have totally different values That's than right. our culture. Yeah. So. Oh, yeah. I've thought about that a lot. So I have a little bit of a topic, but we can, if you have more observations, I very uh, much welcome I, them. I don't. I only have more emotions. I can't, I'll just end it by saying, I have, I had no anticipation of the intensity of my reaction and how positive it was to the cold and the snow. I, I, I thought I would visit it sort of like you go to a zoo. Yeah. You don't, you don't want to be an yeah. antelope as, as a result of going to the zoo. But uh, I, I really was moved by life there. That's all I want to well, say. Well, that's also, you know, you, you're you such a traveler. As you just said, you've been to 20 countries alone in the continent of Africa. How many have you been to in total, by the way? Like 130. <laughs> that is bleeping unbelievable. I agree. But I, like you, am obsessed with traveling. I love it. I want to see the world before I leave the world. But you know something I've realized? It is becoming more of a priority for me to see my own country before I see other countries. Mm -hmm. Or at the very least, prioritize seeing my own country as much as seeing others. I I think people, especially Americans, overlook that. Like I, I want to go to every state. You could. I want to go to Nebraska. So here's a question. Right. Just a fun question for me. What do you think my fiftieth state to visit was? Ooh. Hawaii. Totally logical. No. It's oh wait, it's somewhere near us. I feel like it's somewhere like you wouldn't expect. So Sean guessed it. What did but he, he say? But he he didn't guess it. He he's heard me say it on the air. What? Is that correct, Sean? You've heard me say it. <laughs> what did he say? Sean is unique. He is unique. Don't give him too much credit, wait, though. Unique or eunuch? He so he did hear me say it, and then I said, "Did you hear me say it?" And he goes, "Is there something wrong with that?" Okay, so what is it? North Dakota. So and the interesting thing. So Sue was with me. My, actually, my two spouses. So Sue and Alan. Oh my God. They were. They, <laughs> yes, it's, right. So they were both with me, and we were driving. I it was. I've been to 49 states. By the way, I've spoken in 48. I have not spoken in the two Dakotas. It's pretty damn cool. It is. I agree. I've spoken in four. It's damn cool. You got you're you're, you're moving. Anyway, when I got to North Dakota, so I have I have pictures of me in front of many many welcome to whatever state it is. I get out of the car. Really? I I love that. I didn't know that about you. You should do that. It's it's a fun thing to have. So welcome to North Dakota. I get out. You you probably don't know this, but Pope John Paul II Mm -hmm. is a major pope. And he was the most traveling pope in the history of the papacy. I read a biography on him. Oh, he's an amazing man. I met him. Oh yeah, that that's you the one the in your office. Of me, yes. Yeah, with Joseph Telushkin. Right. So cool. anyway, he would arrive at any country and then at the airport he would kiss the ground. Which what? is a sweet thing. Oh. I, I, I 
I want to kiss your country, basically. Sweet. So I did that in front of the North Dakota side. <laughs> My 50th state, Woo! I'm kissing, kissing the, the ground. ground. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I have I have so many topics, but you just inspired something I've been wanting to, to ask you about. So I was saying that I am just as motivated to see my own country as I am to see other countries. And look, obviously, no offense to people living in Nebraska, but going to Italy or going to, you know, France is a bit more exciting, understandably, than going to Nebraska. The people of Nebraska would agree. Right. Yes. Yeah. It's not, it's it's right. just true. So but but I I love my country and I want to understand it. You mm-hmm. know, I want to be Alexis de Tocqueville, but in the 21st century. And I want to go around and write all these observations and meet people. Uh, by the way, Democracy in America, the uh, de Tocqueville book is so, so good. But and so relevant. Everything he observes, like it's like he's in the country today. Anyway. Actually, a big reason why I am redoubled in my motivation to see this country before or alongside seeing others is because of the way that I have seen a lot of secular left-wing Jews react to the October 7th massacre in Israel. Allow me to elaborate. I have noticed that a lot of such individuals have woken up to the craziness in our own country, uh, the the absurd wokeness, anti-Americanism and anti-Westernism because of what happened on October 7th and seeing that Jews don't count as oppressors, or excuse me, don't count as oppressed, they're viewed as oppressors, that, you know, the left talks all about protecting women and Me Too and no sexual violence, but then when Israeli women are raped, they, they deny it and overlook it. And, and so for a lot of secular left-wing Jews, I've seen them kind of have this moment. And I notice, and obviously I'm, I'm speaking from my own anecdotal experience with such individuals. I'm not saying this is true of every single <laughs> secular left-wing Jew, but they're very obsessed with what's going on in Israel right now. Understandably. Understandably. There's a war. There's threats to the exa- – I totally understand that. But I will also say I can't help but wonder, why don't you – why don't you care about your own country and what's going on here as much as you're caring about Israel? I don't begrudge that you're caring about Israel. What I don't like is that we are encountering, thankfully, a, a different in, in um, you know, like immediacy of threat, but nevertheless, very pressing issue in this country with the undermining of our freedoms, the crazy, I mean, there's just Actually, a- so I want I want to say first, criticism of Jews is not the same as anti-Semitism. Of course not. Yes, I, 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 and criticism of Israel it, is not it, the same. If as it is, then the Torah is anti-Semitic because <laughs> the, the Torah is very critical of Jews, right. and so are the prophets. Okay. And by the way, it's, the irony is it's a credit to Jews that they canonize their critics. Yeah. No other religion did that. Right. Canonized means made made a Bible of the critics of their own people. Yeah. The prophets and God himself and Moses. Okay. So the the left wing Jew has never prioritized Israel and is probably not now. Oh, you you would be surprised. Liberal liberal Jews. Okay, that's fair. That's fair. I should have said liberal. Left wing Jews can't stand Israel. I just, but do they you, hate Netanyahu as much as they hate Trump. Do you take my point, and, and please obviously cut in and, and challenge me if you don't, but I do see a lot of liberal Jews in this country who are paying far more attention to Israel and are more obsessed and invested in Israel than, I'm sorry, they are in their own country. And I want them, right. to, so, I want them to be as invested in America as they are in Israel. So they would probably say we, we are, but America is not threatened with destruction, Israel is. Understood. So it, it's sort of like the, the patient with a bad flu, this is, would be perhaps their answer. The patient with a bad flu doesn't need my attention as much as the patient who might have terminal cancer. So, but, but the way I would phrase your question is, and I, I wrote a column on this already, Mm-hmm. So, to my dear fellow American Jews, left of me, 
to the mm-hmm. left of me. Are you putting two, to, two, two and two together? Are you not realizing that the American hating left is also an Israel hating left? That's what I would like to have American Jews, liberal slash left, whatever, to, to meditate on. These are really bad people. And their hatred of America and their tearing down every one of our institutions should have been an indication that they're, they're not a good crowd. What they have done to the universities, what they've done to high schools and elementary schools, what they've done to teaching, what they've done to medicine. The AMA is a corrupt organization. The FDA is a corrupt organization. The CDC is the NIH. Is. Right. The arts have been, have been horribly affected. Race relations have been unbelievably badly affected by the left. Hugely. Uh, so that was not a wake-up call. The fact that they are okay with people who wish to exterminate Jews, that is what you needed to wake up? That's the way I would put it. No, no, yes. And, and no, no, yes. Um, what bothers me is that, again, not speaking for all liberal Jews, I'm just saying my, from my own observations, because I know a lot of liberal Jews, <laughs> being from Los Angeles, schools I went to, et cetera. I think that they see thank God, what a threat the left is to Israel. I think that many of them, speaking in broad strokes, tend to brush off or minimize the threat that left is to America. Bravo. A 100% agree. I really, 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 did I say really? Don't like. And I resent that hugely. A, because it's stupid. Because it's all part of, you know, a greater cabal of peddling evil but b it's like this is your own uh, this is your country i'm sorry but israel is not your country and i understand that yeah. jews no, for no, jews no. israel yeah. is I, there, I, very I, important I, i'm not I, I don't go there totally with you that's okay. not that's their flaw is not that they care about israel more than america they don't but they do know again back to the issue israel the the threat to israel's existence the ability to make Israel into a Nazi camp is real. It is. That, so that they perceive. Okay. They don't, the, their, their issue is not that they care about Israel more than America. It's that they don't perceive the threat of the left to America like they perceive the threat of the yep. left to Israel. That's, yep. That's the issue. It's not a matter of caring about America less. If they cared about America less, they, they wouldn't live here. Right. And and I understand. I mean, look, you know, I am the biggest advocate of the, the state of, of Israel and its right to exist, its right to defend itself. I am very and well aware. And dinner every week. Yes. And I am very well aware of the of of what a dire moment we're in right now as far as the threat of extermination of the state of Israel. I am totally under un, understanding of that. But again, I just many of these liberal Jews who I know, they've been to Israel one time. And I know how important, but it's like, this is, you are American. Right, and it but doesn't it mean back, that you, yeah, it, but, but again, it's I not want that you they, to care about America. No, what you want, okay, I, I have to restate the way, I mean, and you could reject it, obviously. I it's the way I stated it, but yeah, now the, I'm kind of adding I don't it. agree with the way you're stating it. Okay. It is not that they care about Israel more than America. It's that they perceive the threat of the left to Israel more than I'm they sorry, perceive I the threat to, to America. I'm sorry, I have to disagree. I think a lot of them care more about Israel than they do about America. Yeah, okay. I have to right, disagree with you. Right. And you know what? But, but care you, about you, Israel, you, but care but, about America too. Dennis Prager here with a man I have come to admire for his work. So when I asked him, what do you do? This is the title he gave, Wealth Architect. Very simply put, I am a wealth architect that helps my clients accelerate the way they grow your wealth. It's not how much you make, it's how much you keep. The Internal Revenue Code is embedded with a number of things that you can take advantage of. It's what I call playing tax chess. We take the time to play tax chess in your favor. We give our clients unbiased, independent advice across all areas in their financial life because we have no incentive to sell anything. I was taken enough and impressed enough to have you do my work and you have in fact saved me serious amount of money charlesdombeck.com slash prager i'm trying to think of uh a way to explain it because i know these people very well 
there, the, no, here, maybe you'll buy this way of phrasing it. They're more worried about Israel than they are about Totally, America. they are. But that doesn't mean they care about Israel more. An American Jew can become an Israeli citizen tomorrow if they move to Israel. They have chosen to live their lives and raise their children in America. I mean, the, the Jews, Jews developed uh, Superman. Superman was a super patriot. Jews developed much of Hollywood. The early movies of Hollywood in the 30s and 40s were super gung-ho patriotic. Right. It's the Jews drifting to the left that, that has been the catastrophe of, of both Jewish life and partially of American life. But it's not that they care about Israel. As I said, they hate Netanyahu as much as they hate Trump. Right. Okay. They're I see your but, point. but they are, and, and in this sense, they're right. There is no, the, the irony is there is an existential threat to America. It's from the left. So it, 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 I go back to. This is my third time, I guess. I hope those <laughs> ah. listening will forgive me. They are they do not perceive the left wing threat to America the way they perceive the left wing threat to Israel. Yep. I mean, I agree. I, I don't understand I'll I'll say this this final thing and then we can move on, but I don't understand how many of these individuals didn't see this coming. And I'm very thankful that there are many are awake or sort of awake now. But I have to say, it reminded me a bit of the, I don't think it was Bonhoeffer, but it was another German uh, pastor who had that great quote. Name Muller. Thank you. That said, you know, they came for the communists. I wasn't a communist. They came for the, you know, so I didn't speak. whatever. So I didn't yeah. speak up. I, they came for the Jews. I wasn't a Jew, so I didn't speak up. They came for the disabled. Da, 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 and then they came for me and there was no one left to speak up. I have to say, and perhaps I'm, this is a bit heavy handed, but I couldn't help but think of that. You know, you're right. Because it's like, right. you know, so so wait a minute. Right. So you were fine with when. Right. Oh, I, I don't excuse it at all. It's right. disgusting. That's you were correct. fine with the right. with with people dividing, you know, oppressor versus oppressed before right. it affected yes, you. That's you were fine with Black Lives Matter ruining the lives of Black people and saying and you know saying that certain violence is okay and looting is okay because it's taking back what's theirs. That's the same argument that they're using right now with Israel. They're saying Hamas right. is is justified that's in their raping and beheading of Israelis because they're taking back what's theirs. Right. So you were fine with it when it was Black Lives Matter, but now they're coming for you and they're coming for right. Israel, I, and now you're right. speaking up. I'm sorry, but it makes me upset it because me more because upset it has brought us Jew. here. It has brought us here, and it is it's not it's not not fair to overlook all of those other instances of moral egregiousness because it didn't affect you and now it does affect you and how do you like it <laughs> sorry just makes me upset one of the things that I really dislike in life is a naive adult mm. if you're six and you're a, and you're naive I'm, I'm still not happy but I could live with it. But if you're 60, you're an idiot. You yep. have desired to be an ignoramus. Ign ignoramus and naive are almost synonymous. It means you're ignorant of, of real life because you've chosen to be. If you were naive about communism when Stalin and, and, the, and the rest of the gang were in power, or Lenin even, that you chose to be. Yes, absolutely. People people willfully blindfold themselves. Yes. They don't want to know. They don't want to deal with it. And they'd rather live in their in right. their world. What percentage, uh, listen, this is hardly a uniquely Jewish issue, but what percentage of, of Western Jews were gung-ho about bringing in millions of people from the Middle East? But now that these people from the Middle East in, in large numbers hate Jews, which is what I said, hello, do you know that they bring their values with them? Do you know that they hate Jews in the Middle East? Are you stupid? Right. And and that, yes, we, we get it. By the way, Alan, um, 
Alan and his bedtime stories, which, by the way, people are probably going, what? What is that? Well, you it's, can get it if you join Pregatopia. Yeah, it's yep. the name of the um, the email that Alan sends before every night before Dennis's show with with certain news stories. And he sent one. I'm sure you, you talked about it on the air, or maybe you didn't, but you will. Uh, where um, this French journal did a survey of, of Muslims living in France, Muslim immigrants. Yeah. And it's like the, the stat, you know, many, many percentages are saying they want Sharia law over French yeah. law, that they want the destruction of Israel. I mean, this is, I, well, I just wanted to substantiate the, the, your point because yes, people are yeah. going to go, oh, you're exaggerating. I want them to, well, that that's the, what they the, do. They gaslight. Right. Sweden virtually had no rapes until Muslim immigrants came, to which the left will say that's Islamophobia. And do you know why they will say it? Because the left never asks, it is, tr is it true? Mm -hmm. They never ask about a statement that they don't like to hear. Right. Is it true? Because I swear before God, I believe this. Truth is not a left-wing value. That is not an attack. It is a fact like the earth is round and revolves around the sun. Totally. I mean, look at, look at the men and women thing. Correct. But, but <laughs> I want people to understand how they avoid it. They avo they, what I just said, the question is not, is it Islamophobic? The question is, is it true? Are Muslims, Muslim immigrants and their children the primary culprits in rape in Sweden? Yes. So it's either true or not true. It's not Islamophobic or it's not Islamophobic. It's either true or not true. Right. Mm -hmm. Do we have time for a, a quick other thing I had in mind? I, I have no a sense. A quick of... other thing. Take Q QOT. We have five minutes. We have five minutes? Yeah. Oh. Do it anyway. You know, I just, I just want to say quickly, and we'll move on from it, but I, w I want people to understand that I am well aware of why so many liberal Jews are very obsessed with and upset about Israel and why they are caring about it a lot. I, I don't want any of what I said to be construed as my not understanding that. My point is, please consider and give the same energy to, to the country that you live in, America, and the threat that the left poses to our country, Correct. which is facilitating the grave threat that the left poses to Israel. Peace and love. Yes. The only thing I would modify is, please, I would just reverse the sentence. Please be aware that the same left that supports the destruction, annihilation, and Holocaust in Israel is the same left that is destroying America. Right. That's the way I would put it. Okay, I have a question for you. And I love how we're saying, we'll move on, we'll move on. But I have, I do have another question for you on this. How how do you feel about liberal Jews who will have a is Israel flag bumper sticker on their car or put an Israel Israeli flag in front of their house, but they won't have an American flag on their bumper sticker or in front of their house or on their computer? Yes, uh, they they should. I, I that's agree the point I'm more. trying to make. Okay, that's that's fair. Uh, I and I get Israel is, I will, is I will under say, risk though, of destruction right now, and we're not. Just remember the the most pro Israel Jews tend to be the most pro-American Jews. They're the Jews who vote uh, uh, conservative, think conservative. I, I went to a, uh, I went to an Orthodox Jewish school. Mm -hmm. all, all the teachers were either Israeli or from Eastern Europe. We said the Pledge of Allegiance every day in, yep. in front of an American flag, obviously. Uh, we had a George Washington play every year for Washington's birthday. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, that's so sweet. There, it's uh, very see, endearing. The, so they generally go together. Right. And and I wish people understood if you support America and, and there's a strong America, there will be a strong Israel. You're right. People are That is what you, yes. sh you should be so gung ho trying yes. to protect your own country if you care so much as you should about the, the annihilation that Israel is facing. We, anyway, I feel like I've beaten it to death, but Fair enough. I appreciate your, your listening. Um, okay. So quickly. This may be another Dennis and Julian to its own, but 
I had this realization and I, and I think you'll, you'll like it. You know, we're, we're so close and I'm, I'm so grateful that we are. And you and I have talked about the very tragic day when you will die. And it's, un- it's not something we talk about often. Or so, Julie, we have about. five minutes to go. <laughs> I know. And she brings up my death. <laughs> I know. I was like, uh... yeah, that'll take it. That'll take three minutes. <laughs> so go on. Um, and you know, we like, and we say that there will be a large part of my life for which you will not be present. Mm-hmm. Several, God willing, if I live a long life, you know, several decades, and it made me think. You won't know me when I'm old, mm-hmm. but I didn't know you, mm-hmm. no offense, when you were young. Mm-hmm. And it's sort of like, but but you, we know each other now, and, and I feel like even when I'm old, you, you still will know me because I, I think I'll be the same That's person. That's correct. I, Whereas I feel like I kn- knew you when right. you were young because be you're no the different. same person. It, it would have been a, yeah. a younger face. Yeah. That's the only difference. Yeah. That's exactly correct. But it just it just made me wonder would there be a difference I'm, gl- no, I'm glad no, you agree with no, me I don't exa- think so and I, and I believe I will I know you when you'll be 70 that's correct you're, you're right on both on both scores isn't that weird to think about yeah, like it's, it's a very interesting you won't know way me at that I know. time in my life yes I know and, and I never I never saw you and right you know all those years I mean a lot of the people listening saw saw right. you and listened yes, to you I before in, I was I even a thought in my 30s yeah well, my my that, young thirties. That was relatively quick for having brought up your death. Yeah. So <laughs> just for the record, for those interested, the odds are, and it's all it is is odds, but they're not. That's not insignificant. I'll live a long life, and healthy life because my parents did. Ninety six, and my mother died at eighty nine only because she had type two diabetes, which I am taking care not to get. I don't need any sugar, for example. And uh, we have no genetic markers. Father was is totally intact. He was doing my tax returns. He was a CPA, certified public accountant, until 90. He was still having clients <laughs> come to his office. So uh, I, hopefully I'll be around to see you marry and have kids. Hopefully. Do you think most people are sort of the same through their whole lives? That's a that's a great question for a whole episode. Are I I wonder that are you who you will be when you're ten? It's that's the question basically you're asking. Yeah, yeah. I, I think about that a lot. I am who I was. I would say. At 13. I don't remember me pre-13 very well. But may, maybe even then, in sixth grade, uh, I lived in Brooklyn, and I went to school in Manhattan. And I didn't live in the part of Brooklyn near Manhattan. I lived in the part of Brooklyn by the Atlantic Ocean. So I was very far from Manhattan. So what was I, 11? Yeah, I was 11. Mm-hmm. Every day, I traveled by train, on my own, bus and train, on my own, bus to the train station. Wow. And came back, I went to school nine to six, because it was half the day Hebrew and half the day in English, religious studies, secular studies. And I come back seven o'clock at night, dark in in the winter, obviously, Mm -hmm. by train and by bus, getting home like 7.30. And I loved it. I loved, sometimes I took the train beyond my station. Really? Just to see what is the, what are the other stations like. Oh, That's and the how people. much I want. And the people, yes. I, so that was me, and I haven't changed. I still want to go beyond my home station and see what other stations are like. That was, that's a good question. 
Tell them how they contact us. You can email me at julie at julie-hartman.com. We need to read listener emails. You have no, I, th- I forward some to you, but yes. you have no we idea should. the quality Maybe of the emails that we get. Maybe we should devote a whole uh, oh show Oh my, it. and they're so varied from different, yeah. I mean, talk about different walks of life. And different parts it of the world. It is so cool. Yeah. So please email me. And, and by the way, if I don't respond, please forward it to me because it gets lost. So you're not rude if you do that. Julie at Julie-Hartman.com. You can also follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Julie R. Hartman. You can follow Dennis on Twitter. Dennis Prager, DennisPrager.com. No, that, but we got to promote the socials. Yeah, but I don't use it much. Don't admit that. Someone okay. Post yeah, for yeah, you. yeah. Absolutely. At Dennis Prager on Twitter, at the Dennis Prager on Instagram. Shalom. <laughs>